All right. Uh, good morning, everybody. Happy Friday. Uh, thanks for joining us this week uh, for this week's AMS some Sports Ultrasound case series. Um, today, uh, we're super fortunate to, to have a good friend of mine, Lauren Rudolph, here, um, who's going to be, be giving a talk on a thumb UCL injury um, with a concomitant stenter uh, lesion. Just a quick couple points about Lauren. Uh, she she did her medical school out east, out of Georgetown, and she switched coast. Well, not really the coast, but close enough to the coast for her uh, PNR residency at the University of Utah. And then she landed uh, in between the two as a fellow here at Iowa, uh, and currently out in uh, Colorado. She's uh, one of the physicians, sports physicians at Banner Health, uh, and she also is a team physician for the University of Northern Colorado. So. With that, I will, uh, I'll give it over to Lauren, really looking forward to this talk and take it away, Lauren. Great, thanks. Um, gonna share screen. Okay, are we good? Looks great. Okay, awesome. Okay, so hello everyone. Excited to share this fun case with you. So let's get started. No disclosures. Outline, as with previous lectures in this series, I'll first provide a brief case presentation, then discuss the scanning protocol for the thumb to meet criteria for a complete ultrasound examination as opposed to a limited examination. We will review the corresponding ultrasound images of the protocol for this specific case. Um, and we'll discuss pertinent anatomy as well as report writing as we go along. So for our case, um, this is a 31 year old right hand dominant male wakeboarder with right thumb pain located predominantly at the base of the right thumb. This started suddenly about a week ago, he fell on an outstretched hand. Specifically, sort of interesting, he was on a boat holding his board overhead and then a gust of wind caused him to fall forward onto the ground while still holding his board. And this reminded me of the well-described skier's thumb mechanism of injury, which occurs with hyper abduction, abduction and or hyperextension of the thumb at the MCP joint. So I was, concern for ulnar collateral ligament injury at this point, pretty early on in our history taking. Um, on exam, so he had ecchymosis at the dorsal, ulnar and palmar aspects of the MCP joint, so pretty diffuse ecchymosis. He was maximally tender at the ulnar aspect of the MCP joint and he had some valgus laxity with stress testing. X-rays taken in the emergency room a few days prior showed no fracture, avulsion, no dislocation of the right thumb. Also noting the scaphoid appears normal. Um, okay, so my diagnostic ultrasound protocol for the thumb is derived from the hand and finger protocol that is published in the AMSSM Sports Ultrasound Curriculum for Sports Medicine Fellowships. And then I know we mentioned this in prior talks, but just as a reminder, these recommendations and protocols have been recently updated and you can get a copy on the AMSSM website. My thumb checklist. So my thumb checklist is listed here. Um, we'll go through each of these items in, in the talk um, with corresponding images from our weight border case. Let's see. There we go. Okay, um, so oh, before we, we jump in, um, a few quick points on technique. So for transducer selection, you'll want to use a high frequency linear array transducer. If you have it available to you, a small footprint transducer is particularly helpful for the thumb, especially around the MCP joint. For patient position, I find it's easiest to have the patient seated in front of you with their hand on a bed or table. That way the patient can easily pronate and supinate uh, their forearm and you can switch back and forth from dorsal and volar thumb as needed. 
For anatomy, we're going to focus predominantly on the ulnar collateral ligament, um, but I highly recommend two prior talks in this series for a more in-depth look at trigger finger and pulley injuries, which can also occur at the thumb. Okay, so let's get going with our thumb protocol and corresponding case images. I start my exam at the dorsal aspect of the thumb with the 15.6 megahertz high frequency linear array transducer, scanning from proximal to distal. We're looking at the bones and joints first. So starting with the distal radius in long axis, we can see the STT joint, first CMC joint, both sites of um, or uh, sites of OA, uh, osteoarthritis commonly. Uh, then we continue scanning to the MCP joint, IP joint, nail and nail bed. I make sure to scan these bones and joints and short axis as well using Doppler when appropriate, which I think was well described last week or sorry, two weeks ago. Um, so, but for example, if I see an abnormality, then I'll, an abnormality, then I'll put the Doppler on it. Continuing with the bones and joints here, I flip to the palmar side of the thumb. Here I'm scanning from distal to proximal, um, leaving the scaphoid for last, given his mechanism of injury. I wanted to get a good look at the scaphoid at the end of the bones and joints portion of the exam. Again, scanning in both short axis and long axis using Doppler when appropriate. And here at the, the bottom image, we can see a nice view of the scaphoid. It has a peanut shape appearance and we don't see any cortical irregularities. I'm gonna present my report findings as we go along. So I said the bones uh, appear intact without cortical disruption, revulsion, nor hematoma. The joints appear unremarkable without effusion, erosions, nor synovitis. Staying on the palmar side of the thumb, I move on to the flexor tendon, scanning the FPL in both short axis and long axis, following it proximal to the carpal tunnel, then distal to its insertion on the distal phalanx. And then I move on to the pulley system, which keeps the FPL closely opposed to the bone. Uh, note in this picture here, the anatomy of the pulley system is different in the thumb than it is in the other digits. And now is when I switch to the small footprint transducer and focus my attention on the A1 pulley where trigger thumb may occur. And everything appears normal. So I can now report on both the FPL and the associated pulley system. So for the report, I said the FPL demonstrates normal fibrillar pattern without hypoepigenicity nor thickening. The FPL is intact without evidence of tearing nor disruption. A1 pulley is intact without thickening. There's no catching with dynamic flexion extension exam and there's no bowstringing with dynamic resisted flexion. We also get a really nice look at the roller plate here. So I move on to that next in more detail. The volar plate of the thumb MCP joint is unique in that it connects to sesamoid bones. In short access top image, um, you can best find it when both sesamoid bones are in view. And then we turn on it in long access and scan radially to the radial sesamoid, then ulnar to the ulnar sesamoid with the volar plate best visualized in between. And for the report, I said the roller plate is intact without evidence of tear or disruption. At this point, I switch back to the dorsal aspect of the thumb to look at the extensor and abductor tendons, starting here with the EPL and short axis. Um, I scan proximally to the distal radius, identify Lister's tubercle, and then the third dorsal compartment of the wrist, which is the EPL. And then I follow the tendon to its insertion on the distal phalanx, and then turn on it and scan it in long axis. I do the same thing for the first dorsal compartment tendons. 
scanning them both in short axis and then long axis, scanning the um, distal radius. So starting at distal radius first, I followed the EPB to its insertion on the proximal phalanx. And then um, recall the APL inserts on the first metacarpal. Commonly seen with multiple distal splits, it can be challenging to follow all the way to its insertion. There's actually a lot of anatomic variability within the first dorsal compartment, which is slightly outside the scope of this talk. Um, but here we do see multiple slits of the APL distal to the retinaculum, and we see an intercompartmental septum separating APL and EPB. These findings can be associated with day Caribbean disease. However, there's no additional evidence of day Caribbean's here. So I just attribute this to anatomic normal anatomic variation and not pathology and try to explain that out in the report, um, specifically stating the tendons appear normal. I describe the anatomic variations and then say, however, there's no thickening of the retinaculum, no sheath effusion, no increased signal with Doppler imaging and no, no pain with sodium palpation. So next, we move to the radial aspect of the thumb. Um, we're still at the MCP joint. And at this point, we add a rolled up towel to better evaluate the radial collateral ligament, uh, which appears normal here in both short axis and long axis. So I reported the radial collateral ligament demonstrates normal fibular architecture without disruption on dynamic varus stress exam. Next, we move to the ulnar aspect of the MCP joint, continuing to utilize the rolled up towel for better patient positioning. Um, so if there's high suspicion of injury, I'll often start with the contralateral side for comparison as I did here. Um, and conveniently, we'll use this contralateral comparison to discuss the normal anatomy and ultrasound appearance of the ulnar collateral ligament now. So for best visualization, start in long axis and attempt to get that tubercle apex of the first metacarpal in view. Then adjust to be more perpendicular to the ligament to get rid of any anisotropy if needed. So the top image is your target image and the bottom image is zoomed in to just better illustrate the normal compact linear appearance of the ulnar collateral ligament after a slight heel toe adjustment. Uh, the ulnar collateral ligament has a slight dorsal to palmar orientation, which may be helpful to think about when trying to obtain your imaging. More important, it's um, pertinent to discuss the anatomic relationship between the adductor aponeurosis and the ulnar collateral ligament. So the adductor aponeurosis originates from the adductor pollicis muscle, and it's seen on ultrasound as a very thin hypoechoic line superficial to the ulnar collateral ligament. The adductor aponeurosis is probably best appreciated with dynamic imaging. Here's a cine loop taken when performing passive flexion and extension at the interphalangeal joint. And hopefully you can see the superficial aponeurosis more clearly. Uh, applying valgus stress can be helpful for comparison from side to side. Uh, valgus stress is especially helpful, I think, in grading the severity of injury on the affected side. So for example, you know, when trying to distinguish between full and partial thickness tears, because here you can see it, it could, uh, different fibers could pull away. Okay, so now we, we've uh, fully evaluated the ulnar collateral ligament contralateral comparison. So we'll move back to the affected side. Here we are in long axis and we see there's basically an absence of any normal ulnar collateral ligament fibers. We also see the presence of a heterogeneous mass-like abnormality that lies proximal to the MCP joint. Notice the ulnar collateral ligament 
is no longer deep to the adduct or aponeurosis. It has instead flipped proximally. The aponeurosis appears irregular and swollen. There's a bony avulsion fragment in the joint space. Um, and for the report, oh, um, so arrows for adduct or aponeurosis, flipped ulnar collateral ligament, bony fragment. And then for the report, I said the ulnar collateral ligament appears irregular and heterogeneous in contrast to the contralateral comparison. There is um, absence of normal ulnar collateral ligament fibers with that heterogeneous mass-like abnormality. Uh, proximal spine CP joint. There's a displaced full thickness tear with the distal detachment, with distal detachment proximal attraction consistent with standard lesion. And there's a hyperechoic focus with shadowing suggestive of a bony avulsion of the proximal phalanx in the NCP joint. And this was confirmed surgically. Uh, so it's um, so it's important to distinguish a stenor lesion from the other variations of ulnar collateral ligament injury, because when the ulnar collateral ligament is displaced proximal to or superficial to the adductor aponeurosis, as in a stenor lesion, it gets trapped and, and then primary healing is prevented. So this is an indication for surgical repair. There is a spectrum of ulnar collateral injuries um, as illustrated here. So I just wanted to take a minute to go over the other possibilities that may be seen and reported. So we, let's see, so we talked about normal, the normal appearance of an ulnar collateral ligament. For a sprain, it'll look diffusely thickened and diffusely hypoechoic. For a partial thickness tear, it'll look like an incomplete hypoechoic or anechoic disruption of the ligament fibers. A full thickness tear will, um, without displacement will look like a complete hypochoic or anechoic disruption without fiber displacement. So in other words, the ulnar collateral ligament will remain deep to the adduct or aponeurosis in contrast to a stenor lesion, which is a full thickness tear with displacement and therefore ulnar collateral ligament is no longer deep to the adduct or aponeurosis. For our report um, heading or title, complete diagnostic thumb ultrasound examination, uh, referring physician listed if, if appropriate, pre-procedure diagnosis, right thumb pain, post-procedure diagnosis, keeping it short and sweet, center lesion, um, comparison to the right thumb x-rays, and then procedure performed, mentioning that it's a complete diagnostic ultrasound examination of the right thumb, I list the different transducers used and then list the thumb checklist structures that were evaluated. We went through the findings already. So I will skip down to the impression. Um, this was an abnormal complete diagnostic ultrasound of the right thumb revealing displaced full thickness tear of the ulnar collateral ligament of the metacarpophalangeal joint consistent with stenor lesion. Uh, so summary, um, I, um, so the key points for scanning the ulnar collateral ligament for transducer selection, you wanna use a high frequency linear array transducer with a small footprint, sometimes called a hockey stick. For patient position, use a rolled towel to allow some slight thumb abduction. It really allows you to get the small uh, footprint transducer into that first dorsal web space. Start with the correct imaging plane and look for the first metacarpal tubercle apex. Utilize the contralateral comparison. Use interphalangeal joint flexion extension to isolate the adductor or aponeurosis. Consider valgus stress to help evaluate extent of injury. Um, and then a reminder to adhere to the protocol. So for example, in this case, we wouldn't have wanted to miss a scaphoid fracture or a dislocation injury pattern, um, which would have included volar plate injury potentially or radial collateral injury, in addition to the ulnar collateral ligament injury that we 
saw in this case in isolation. And that is it. Questions, comments, and I'll leave references up for you all. Great job, Lauren. That was that was exceptional. Um, I'll let I'm gonna let Doug make some comments first. I know he has to jump off here, um, and then I'll I'll make a, a couple after him. So all yours, Doug. Yeah, Lauren. Um, really nice presentation, and particularly your images are beautiful. I mean, anybody that does ultrasound knows it's not easy, particularly on these small joints. Um, and those images were really nice. Um, I I just have a couple of comments. Hey, could you? Go back to that slide showing the aponeurosis. The video or the? No, just that, that had a cartoon. Yeah, that one. Oh, uh-huh. So something that, go forward one. Or uh, it has that cartoon of the, or. Oh, cartoon. Yeah. Got it. Uh, normal? Yeah, or you're showing the stenters. Yeah. There. No, what, go another one. Let's see. It had all those series. Yeah, that one. Oh, these, right. yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you can't see my um, cursor here, but there's a thought process that um, when the aponeurosis completely covers, um, including the attachment and insertion of the of the UCL that you really don't get a Stenner's lesion, but when it partially covers it. So if you look at the one over D and imagine that it was the, the attachment was just slightly distal. And so it is partially uncovered, then you're at higher, higher risk of a Stenner's lesion. But imagine if, if the insertion was a little more proximal, it's unlikely to flip under it. Um, so that's not talked about, but it's something that ultrasound has taught me um, with this is that the, the morphology of the aponeurosis um, can predict, not predict, but in a sense, um, influence the risk of developing a Stenner's lesion. Um, on your video that, that you do, I often, what, what I will often do is also, I'll take the video and then I'll go back and scroll to uh, when the bones are at its uh, narrowest point and then at its widest point and measure that um, from that video. So I actually will give a number um, and just because sometimes surgeons like a number. Um, we've learned a couple other things from ultrasound. So one biggie for me is avulsion fracture. So when I was learning and in, in early in sports medicine practice, if you saw a bony fragment on x-ray, you shouldn't do a stress test because you might be pulling that fragment off. And what I've learned from ultrasound is that that's really rare. It's really common to see a bony fragment, but the bony fragment is often embedded or only part of the ligament. And so I have yet to see an injury where if I were to perform a valgus stress test, I would be displacing that bony fragment. Um, so again, I th I've learned that ultrasound has taught us that these avulsion fractures um, typically don't involve the entirety of the footprint at the insertion of the ligament. And it's probably okay to do valgus stress testing. Another thing we learned is, is, is that um, often I will see um, not a Stenner's lesion and what we call a 2.5 grade, meaning hanging by a thread. And, and so you just see a couple fibers attached, but they are lax with valgus stress testing. And as you point out, compared to the contralateral side, and these people don't do very well. Um, most of these people, the quote 2.5 grade, almost a complete tear, but not quite, but showing significant laxity and barely hanging on a couple fibers, most commonly go to surgery. Um, and just from experience of seeing these and treating them operatively and non-operatively. And then I guess my last comment is, from my point of view, the most common differential diagnosis that I see is what I call a beat up MCP joint. And so the UCL is a little ragged, slightly thick, but not torn. The RCL is a little ragged and thick and not torn. You see a little bit of capsular hypertrophy. You see a little joint effusion, depending on how acute or subacute it is. I suspect that this is a compaction type injury to the joint. I would guess that there's probably some articular cartilage uh, involvement that we don't see. Um, and that is, the most common differential that I see is that that joint gets beat up 
um, but we don't actually have a uh, clinically significant ligament tear. So that's my two cents worth. Um, thoughts, uh, Lauren or Rob, uh, Ryan? Thank you, that was really insightful and helpful um, just to hear your experience with multiple uh, ulnar collateral ligament injuries, thanks. Yeah, no, I think that, that that's all great information as usual, um, Doug. So thanks for that. I don't really have much more to add, um, uh, really at all, Lauren. I thought, like I said, you did a great job, and, and like Doug said, your your pictures were were absolutely fantastic. Um, it, those are can sometimes be rather challenging to get a great picture of the UCL just because of the orientation of those fibers. And um, but I thought your your images were great. I think the, the protocol that you have is pretty darn uh, close, if not almost the exact same as, as my protocol. And, and like we've harped on with all of these talks, protocols with ultrasound are really important. Um, you know, there can be a tendency, especially in the case that you just presented, where, um, you know, for all the world, the history and the physical exam is a slam dunk UCL injury. And then you know, you get excited, you grab your ultrasound, you pop it right on the UCL and you just start there and you don't look at any other structures and, and you can very easily get burned, um, you know, missing a scaphoid fracture or a, or a pulley injury. And so staying with the protocol um, every single time is, is critical. And I thought you, you described that quite nicely. Um, I as well, like a hockey stick here, I think any larger footprint is just so hard to get a good image. Um, just because of the, the small region that you're scanning here. Um, I think you mentioned using the towel. That's important. That can help with patient positioning. I also have them um, have them seated. And then you made a point, which I completely agree with, you know, scanning the contralateral slide. This is the, the, the first MCP joint's a sloppy joint at baseline in most people. Um, and so in a lot of times there can be quite a bit of play and, and some laxity in that joint, um, which is not necessarily pathologic. And so, you know, we are all given two sides. And so looking at the other side, the contralateral side to see what's normal for that patient um, can, be, can be really, really helpful. So that's, uh, that's all I, I have. Again, I thought that was, that was just really well done. So great job. Thanks. Um, all right. Well, 802, I guess we will call it at that. Um, thanks again, <clears throat> Lauren. Again, really great job. Um, thanks for coming on and, and giving this talk and, and teaching us all something uh, on, a, on a Friday morning here. So we are off next week. We're back on October 1st. Uh, Pierre Demacourt will be talking about some hip pathology, um, a, a patient with a hip labrum tear and, and borderline uh, uh, hip dysplasia. So again, that'll be on 10-1. Otherwise, happy Friday, happy weekend. Everybody have a, have a good one and we'll see you all in a couple of weeks.